So that's the secret to getting your dissertation done in five minutes or less. Now, for the rest of you. <laughs> um, so this is, this is a sort of a combination of two talks that I've given um, for a number of decades, for quite a while. Um, because in trying to help students figure out, oh, Brian, do you want to say a few words or do you just want to make sure we're... I always right. tell all my students that half of what I tell them is wrong. The same standard applies to Susan. <laughs> <laughs> Only half? The trick, will be, well, the trick will be to figure out which half. Only it half? It will be different for each other. But, but, if you don't know that before, people were gossiping about your food habits. Yeah, we think we're prepared. <laughs> it, it never ceases to amaze me what ends up being topics of conversation about me. I was at a conference once and found out that there were a bunch of graduate students and postdocs talking about my clothes, my car, <laughs> and my beard. <laughs> <laughs> no, I knew in graduate school and put that you didn't get to have a life, but I didn't realize it was that. <laughs> the car got better. Uh, yeah, I have a 98 cc engine now instead of a 65, so it's like a fancy lawnmower. <laughs> of course, the beard. <laughs> Timing is everything. Mm -hmm. um, so, in my background, I um, got a PhD. I actually study technology and the transformation of work. And um, turns out that research is a kind of work, and teaching is a kind of work. And those are two kinds of work that are actually undergoing enormous transformation right now. Um, the other side of my life is I do a lot of reviewing, a lot of associate editor work, a lot of senior editor work. I've uh, been at the University of Maryland since the middle of January. Prior to that, I was at the National Science Foundation, where uh, as a program officer, I handled, you know, assigned to get reviewed, or did reviewing on, wrote the equivalent of associate editor reports, recommending funding or not funding, uh, upwards of 100 proposals a year. Right. So I've seen a lot. I've seen a lot of papers, and there's some regularity to it. Um, <clears throat> and I realized after a while, when I was a, a young junior faculty, that I was repeating myself in my reviews. I was telling people the same stuff over and over again. So I thought, let's just pull that out. <clears throat> and I'm telling you my secret. Because often, you know, it's, it's like I just have this standard checklist, and then I apply it to the paper that I'm reviewing, and then when they need the feedback, I just pull out that piece and give it to them. Interestingly, I talked to a senior editor recently, and I said, you know, I, I feel like I'm, I'm often a very negative reviewer. And he said, oh, no, you're very constructive, because you're one of the few reviewers who tells people how they could make it better. Because what you usually hear as a student and as an author is that writing research, this non-fiction non work, is not like writing fiction. So we tell you what it's not like, but we never tell you what it is like. So let me give you a model for what it is like. And I've got two parts to this model. One is sort of a, a quick thing about um, having a research question. And then the other part is how to do the write-up so that it's like the uh, like you were writing the screenplay to Star Wars, or a Jackie Chan movie, or a Bollywood production, or a murder mystery. It's the same darn structure for all of them. So fill in the blank for any kind of, of um, non or any kind of fiction you like, and it's actually the same structure. And once you see this structure, this underlying structure, then it's much easier to write your thesis or look at any write-up and say, are the parts doing what they need to be doing? And if not, how do I fix it so that it's doing a better job of it? Once you see the underlying structure. So initially, what I'm going to talk to you about a little bit is um, research questions, the role of theory, research models. I really hope that's changing back there, because I can't see it from here. Um, empirical data, the analyses, why you do them, and which ones. and, and these slides will be available to you guys. Um, and then we're going to talk about good write-ups. So the first step is to understand that research is about answering questions. 
All right, that sounds trite. This means if you don't have a question, you don't have a research study. It's amazing how many people don't have a question. <laughs> or they have a question, but it's not a very interesting one. <laughs> so the first thing is, the first step is ask an interesting question. So we're talking about, and, and different things are interesting to different people. But things like, what makes a website good? How can we best support collaborative virtual teams? How do we know if an online community is healthy? These are some interesting questions. So you want to identify an interesting question. It should be something that will solve a problem or help to identify an opportunity. If there's not an obvious problem to be solved, there is a literature on problematizing things. <laughs> how to frame something as a problem. Once you pick up on this, you're going to discover that you have much less tolerance for watching news stories because they're problematizing things that may not be problems. What are the three things in your kitchen that could be killing you? <laughs> OK, they're problematizing your spatula. It's just not <laughs> that exciting, but they're managing to get you all head up about it. Um, you can, so you can practice problematization by just thinking about things that are happening in your life and can you cast that experience as a problem. If it helps, use the fake news announcer voice. And we've discovered today on the, on the UMD, UMD campus, although they say that they value uh, their, their um, veterans, they're not actually going to um, observe Veterans Day. Do they, do they value them or do they not? Right? So we're problematizing the fact that we didn't get Veterans Day off. <laughs> this is not, you can practice this. Um, and then you want to craft some arguments about the importance of this issue to an individual, to an organization, to society. Um, so for example, we had growth in the MIM program this year. We went from 70 students to like 200. This is a fact. Um, that doesn't actually get you a thesis. It doesn't actually get you a dissertation. The next step is you have to actually have a research question. The thing about a research question that's important to know is that it's a question. This means it should be one sentence and it should end in a question mark. <laughs> so when you say, well, I'm studying online communities and citizen science and eBird and stuff. Because, you know, lots of people are liking science. That's not a question. Your elevator pitch has to be something you can boil down to a sentence that has a question mark at the end of it. If you can't do this, you probably need to, because you can write a dissertation and never actually figure out what the research question is, but you're going to be wandering in the woods. It's going to take you a long time. Think about what your question actually is. So, for example, we've got a lot more students in the MIM program. Um, how can we scale up the MIM program while maintaining quality? That's a sentence that ends in a question mark. Uh, will the creation of MIM specializations decrease the number of hours of advising per student? A question that ends in a question mark. One sentence. Uh, now those are different levels of specificity and they're different kinds of questions, but you should at least be able to come up with a research question. Um, the next thing to think about is the role of theory in the question that you're looking at. There are lots of different roles that theory can play. It could be that what you're doing is purely descriptive. You just want to know what is happening. Or you could be trying to build some theory. You might be wanting to know what could account for this outcome. This is the why is this happening. Or maybe we already have some theories, and we want to test whether those theories are accounting for what's happening here. Or you might want to extend those theories. Are these causes the same in a different area? Okay, so you want to actually think about, based on the question you're asking, is there any existing theory that you can draw on? Or are you purely at a descriptive stage in terms of what you're doing? And often early work is purely descriptive. We just want to know, we look at things like um, the demographics of librarians. Right? We, we don't even know what the demographics of the libraries are. That's purely descriptive. You actually want to know why 
you've got some librarians versus others, then you might be wanting to look at theories of um, choice of career. All right, so think about what the role of theory is in terms of illuminating your research question. Uh, so I could go a lot of different ways in thinking about the MIM students. Description would be I could write a paper, something on the number of students pursuing each specialization and the number of hours spent advising students. And this actually wouldn't be a bad thing to do to help manage the MIM program. For, so for people who are at, more at the master's level and interested in doing practical research, data, oriented research with implications for management, this is perfectly fine. We don't need theory here, just do something nice and descriptive, very useful. Um, if you're theory building, you could say, look, having specializations is decreasing advising time per student, uh, maybe because they're creating cohesive social groups that share information with one another. That's asking us, that's answering the question of why this is happening. That's not just what's happening, but why. Um, or you could do theory testing. We may know a lot about the importance of providing information to people that is tailored to their needs, and the specializations provide a set of courses that are tailored to these students' needs. So maybe it's just the information transfer part. And I put theory building as creating the cohesive social groups that share information, because I don't think there's really much theory out there about that for students and advising. I don't know, I made that one up. It was, you know, five o'clock, I had to put something down. And I put the other one in theory testing because I think there's a lot more about tailoring information and how information is used by people in decision making. But as I say, I could be wrong about these. You have to go look at the literature and see if there's really theory that needs to be built or is there existing theory that needs to be tested. There are a number of things that I've read that I've reviewed recently that I've said, mm, we really shouldn't publish this because they're trying to do theory building, but we already have theory. Why do you need new theory? The fact that you'd like to do theory building doesn't necessarily mean that we need new theory. If the old theories are perfectly good, why do you need new ones? So do the literature review and figure out whether there's existing theory. Um, there's also theory extension. So maybe we've got information about um, specializations creating cohesive communities for MIMP students, for master's students, but does this actually work for undergraduates? Does it work for PhD students? Maybe we know it works for undergraduates. We don't know if it's going to work for master's students. So we're extending it. We're looking for the boundaries of the theory. Where does it hold and where does it not hold? Um, so this would bring us naturally to the question of what is a theory? A theory is a statement about relationships among abstract constructs. They're abstract, so they're not tangible, they're not something you can hold, you can hold representations of them, but they're actually, so if I, if, if you're thinking community, I can't really dissect your brain and find a community in there. This is an abstract concept. Okay, what is it really? So you've probably read that definition if you go to a uh, journal, it'll tell you that's the definition of a theory. What is it really? It's boxes and arrows. Every abstract construct is a box, and the arrows are saying which boxes are related to each other, and the theory is explaining why there's an arrow there. So with just boxes and arrows, you've got a model, with an understanding of why those arrows are there, you've got a theory. You guys are madly writing here. <laughs> On to the next one. Because here's a picture of this. There's a research model is at the top. This is associated with that. This causes that. Releasing objects is associated with those objects falling. If I release this object, it is going to fall. Right? You know, do I have to test this? No. <laughs> Becomes a theory if we can explain why. Why is this going to fall? Because the Earth sucks? No. There's this gravity thing. <laughs> now we actually can understand some of the limits of when the pen will fall and when it won't. If we're on the, if we're on the, the uh, space station, it's not falling. So we understand why, then that becomes a theory. 
So, you're writing your, your dissertation or your thesis, or you're writing your report. You should have a research question, and you should start drawing boxes and arrows. What do we think is going to lead to what else? Do we know why? And a research model is actually where you draw these boxes and arrows and connect these things together. And generally, every arrow that you've got there is a hypothesis that you're going to be testing. So in this case, I was saying, well, we think specializations lead to the development of community. That's hypothesis one. And we think that the development of the community actually leads us to spend less time advising. That's hypothesis two. Now, for those of you who've been reading the research literature, saying that specializations lead to community and community leads to advising, what you see in the literature is they'd say that the relationship between specializations and advising is mediated by community. Community sits in the middle, in the middle between specializations and advising. All right, so that's a mediated relationship. Specializations don't affect advising directly. They affect advising through some other mechanism. Here we're saying through the development of communities. I also stuck in program in H3 saying that specializations lead to community for MIMS students, but not for MLS students. Again, I'm just making this stuff up, right? There's boxes and arrows, I can test this. I have no data this is based on. It could have gone the other way. But simply to say that in this model, because program is saying, look, that arrow for H1 is there only for some people and not others, that's a moderated relationship. So mediated means you've got something sitting in between a predictor and an outcome. Moderated says that relationship depends on the level of something else. Right? So um, birth control pills increase the probability of blood clots, but only for women who smoke. That's a moderated relationship. So you often see people confused about mediation versus moderation. Just make sure you get the terminology straight there. And stop at any time if any of this isn't making sense. Because it only gets worse, I promise. Mm -hmm. This brings us to empirical data. For every box, you're going to be collecting data. You're going to have some concrete indicators. You've got a box in your model, you're going to be collecting some information about it. I don't know what kind of information, but you're probably going to have some, you're going to have some information there. Um, so the con for specialization, which of the eight specializations are you in, which electives did you complete, what's your grade point average, this is stuff about specializations. I don't know, we could collect all kinds of stuff about specializations. For community, we could look at the cohesion, the structure, the activities, any measures of community that you want to make an argument for. For advising, maybe we want to look at how much time is spent on individual one-on-one -on -one advising or how much time is spent in group advising, what the, you know, I don't know, make up some stuff you think is good about advising. It's called operationalization, that's the technical term for it. You're actually doing an operationalization, operational definition of the construct. That's where you say, when we actually put this into practice, what do we mean by community? Have an operational definition and then come up with good measures. Right? But every box in there probably ought to have something that you're measuring. And then once you've done this, there's going to be the question of analysis. Your analysis will be testing the arrows. So you've got measures that represent the boxes, and your analysis is testing those arrows. So when I'm reading your paper, and you've given me boxes and arrows, and I get to the analysis section, I'm expecting to see an analysis for each of those arrows. And not analyses for things that were not arrows. What analysis are you going to do? Depends on the nature of those indicators. So here's a, a, a magic 
diagram. You don't have to write that all down. The nature of the analysis that you do depends on the nature of the numbers. So if you've got only one predictor, and it's categorical, so we wanted to know if jobs in data science are, if there are more jobs in data science in California and the Northeast than there are in Texas relative to the population, we could do a chi-square, a one sample chi-square. 10% of the, the population lives in California. Are 10% of the IT jobs there, or are there more than 10%? 10% live in, in uh, Texas. We have more or fewer in there. Often you'll see two predictors, categorical predictors, will, will result in a chi-square. So you want to see if um, specialization and uh, country of origin affect how much time students request for advising. You can do that as a chi-square. Um, so the question is whether you've got categorical predictors, categorical outcomes, continuous predictors, continuous outcomes. So categories are things where you have categories, male, female, um, country of origin, uh, religion, where you can't put them in particular order. It's not that female is more than male, it's just different. Specializations, data science is not more than project management, it's just different from project management. Catholic is not more than Protestant, Protestant is not more than Hindu, they're just different. They're just in categories and there's no particular order to them. Continuous would be things where you've actually got them in order, so something like temperature, GPA, height, those are continuous. So knowing the nature of the data predicts what kind of analysis you're going to be doing. Okay? So in summary, first of all, try and solve an interesting problem. The second part is, can you put it in a sentence with a question mark? Think about the role of theory. What's the role of theory for this? How are you going to address it? Um, what is a theory? They're causal relations. This is causing that. A research model, having boxes and arrows, helps crystallize what it is you're doing and guide the rest of it. The empirical data, you're getting, collecting data about each of the boxes. Your analyses are testing each of the arrows. I know, it sounds easy. It turns out to be really hard. <laughs> and you look at it going, yeah, uh, my stuff? Yeah, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, wait. <laughs> I know, I know, it's an iterative process. So you'll move toward this. This is not something that you go, oh yeah, I'm totally writing this out now. And if you did, you should do it in pencil because you're going to be rewriting it and rewriting it. But really do sit down and write down your research question because that's a touchstone you'll come back to over and over again as you guide the development of your work. It'll tell you what to keep out as much as it tells you what to put in. And for writing, figuring out what not to include is almost more important than figuring out what to include because there is too much out there. All right? So the next step is to think about a write-up. Because once you figure out what the purposes, the points, and the, the various parts of a write-up are doing, that also helps you cut out the things that are not required. So let's talk a little bit about write-ups. And what I'm going to talk about is the structure of a write-up for a theory testing piece. There's, at the end, I'll show you that you can do the same things here for theory building. They'll just be in a little bit different order. But Star Wars is really a testing piece, a, t a theory testing movie, rather than a theory building movie. So we'll start with this, because this is uh, what most of literature is like. 
and what much of the research literature is like. Um, so bear with me. Yeah. Can we do the, contrast those a little bit? I, I don't quite have mm -hmm. clear concepts in my head of theory so, testing versus theory building. Like I think extension I get, um, but. So, so theory building, there's two ways to build theory. Mm -hmm. One way is to sit down like Einstein and say, oh my gosh, you know, it's relativity. Mm -hmm. Wow, cool. Yeah, that doesn't happen that often. Most people do theory building by saying, here's an interesting phenomenon, and I don't understand why it's happening. Okay. So you start with, here's an interesting phenomenon, here's it like MOOCs. Mm -hmm. Here's MOOCs, this is interesting stuff, there's a lot of it going on. Let's go really understand it so that we can figure out what could be predicting. Okay. what's going on, and how those predictors might be related to the outcomes. Okay. So theory building is saying, we don't really know what's going on, so let's go get immersed in the phenomenon. And from that, we're going to try and find what the relative co relevant constructs are, okay. and how they may be related to each other. Okay. And at the end of it, I'll show you my really cool model. <laughs> Right, with a, a really cool theory at the end of it. So the, the reveal okay. at the end of it for theory building is here's the theory. Okay. And now you all should go out and test it. As opposed to theory testing, which is say, you know, we already know about this kind of stuff. We just don't necessarily know about it in this context. Okay. So let's see if this works in this context. Okay. Does that help? Okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So each part of the paper is doing a particular thing. So the introduction is establishing the importance of the issue. That is what your introduction should be doing. If at the end of the introduction you haven't explained to me why this is important, this is not a good introduction. It should culminate in that research question, <coughs> description of your contribution. So at the end of it we say, here's the importance of the issue, and this paper is going to answer this question. One sentence that ends in a question mark. All right? Um, doing so will provide this contribution. Then you've got the background section, the literature review. This is where you tell us what's known about those variables. For each box, there should be a part of your literature review. In your boxes and arrows model, there should be a, a literature, part of the literature review devoted to that box, that construct. Tell us what's already known about it. That is relevant to us understanding why there would be an arrow between that one and another one. So that doesn't mean tell us everything that's known about it, because there's a lot of stuff that's known about it that's not relevant. And if you've got to tell us everything that's known about it, your thesis is going to be, first of all, way too big. And second of all, you know how magicians are successful? You know what they do to be successful? They get your attention over here while they're doing stuff over here. It's misdirection. So if you put stuff in that's not relevant to predicting that arrow, you're misdirecting your reader. You're telling the reader, look at all this really cool stuff. And then they go, well, but I was looking at that. What, what, what? What are you doing? And they'll get confused. So don't put in the extra stuff. It's just going to confuse people because they're going to expect you to do something with it later and you're not going to because it's not related to your arrow, so it's not going to wind up in the analyses and it's going to confuse people. Okay? So at the end of this, we should have a model, boxes and arrows, and hypotheses should be clearly stated. Uh, you have a method section. This is where you say, and here's what I'm going to do to test these arrows. The results section will tell us whether you confirmed or disconfirmed the hypotheses, were your hypotheses supported or not. The discussion will tell us whether you confirmed that background part. So the results are, were the arrows really there? And the discussion is, now what do we know about the background, those variables and their behavior that we didn't know before? 
And the conclusion is saying, oh yeah, this is why we thought our answer was important. Now, if I just stopped there, you guys would probably not know what to do with this information. Right? Yeah. So, um, I have a question that all these uh, sections are part of very important uh, for a paper. Mm -hmm. But I noticed that there are some paper which don't have hypostasis. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I wonder when the hypothesis is necessary, when we can actually don't need hypothesis, just the research question. So if, if you're testing theory, that's a good question. If you're testing the theory, then you'll, you will have a question that's a sentence with a question mark. Figure out whether you're trying to build theory, test theory, extend theory. So know whether there's a theory. Um, causal arrows, be able to draw the boxes and the, and the arrows. Okay, what if you have a, okay, sorry. What if you have a not theory that you're trying to use? So it actually is descriptive, but you're then trying to use it as a theory. Like people call it, no, that's a framework, that's a structure, it's not a theory. Is that different then? So, so frameworks are more general and abstract. Yeah. And so something, um, and, and you, you, you can tell you're in a framework rather than a theory because you cannot get a hypothesis. There's no interesting hypothesis. So um, I'm trying to remember the guy's name who did um, Goffman, self-presentation -pres theory, where he said everybody has a public part and it is, we're all actors on a stage. We're all acting out a role. And we have our public persona, and then we have the backstage part. Um, people have tried to, to talk about that, self-presentation -present theory. You can't come up with a hypothesis. My hypothesis is that I'm now in my backstage role. Well, that's not very interesting. So. They felt, but it's a really useful idea. It's a cool idea. It's a really interesting framework. But it's really a framework. It's what, um, his name is who somebody, I found it not too long ago. I could find it again. There's like a sage pamphlet on sensitizing concepts. So if you don't have something specific enough for a theory, you may have a framework and sensitizing constructs that help illuminate what's happening, but you don't really have boxes and arrows in a causal model. What you have is an analysis uh, sort of frame. So if you're taking a framework that somebody else developed, and then you're saying, I want to turn it into a theory. Then you have to say, what would, who would be the main characters, and why would you think that one would be related to another? OK. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So there are lots of things that are kind of at a framework level. And they're fairly abstract. They, they show you the interesting areas to look. So, but they, they're not <coughs> really sort of testable hypotheses. That's sort of like the, the yeah, but so what test? Kind of. well, this, is, this is like, are you in general relativity or are you in quantum mechanics? Right? So you can look at the same phenomenon. And this is actually why they're looking for the Higgs boson and the God particle is to try to reconcile quantum mechanics and general relativity. So physicists could be looking at general relativity, they could be looking at quantum mechanics, they could be in string theory. That's kind of a, a framework, a, sense, a set of sensitizing constructs. But that's not really a theory. That's really saying which part of the phenomenon as I, am I looking at? Yeah, there's a whole level of things that are not that specific. Other questions? Because the alarm hasn't gone off yet. We can keep going. Because <laughs> Diane did have the question about uh, process models versus variance models. This theory testing is really about variance models. Process models actually say, and, and if you want to think of a really good process model, are things like kids. 
kids are born, and they change between the time they're born and the time they die of old age. That's a process. They develop object permanence. So when this pen goes underneath the table, you still know it's there. You didn't think it disappeared. That's why none of you plays peekaboo these days. <laughs> With babies, you know, you're like, peekaboo, and they think you're really gone. <laughs> they don't have object permanence yet. They do develop that after a few months, and then peekaboo is nowhere near as much fun for them. The object is they figured out that it's permanent. Even if they can't see it, it still exists. They go through conservation of liquid and conservation of mass. If you take the water and you pour it from a tall, skinny thing into a broad, shallow thing, it's still the same amount of water. How they get from one, when the stages happen and how they get from one stage to another, that's a process model. First you've got this stage, then you have this one, then you have this one. First they crawl, and then they walk, and then they run. And so understanding how those stages go from one to another and how that process unfolds, that's another type of model, another type of theory. So what I've presented is really the, the accounting for variance part of this. But if you've got a process model, you're still going to have to set up dramatic tension in your introduction. You're still going to want to tell me about these different stages and the main characters. What you're going to have are probably predictions about how and why they move from one to another. You're going to be collecting data to test those predictions, doing some kind of analysis. You're going to have the results of that, and it's going to be illuminating the main characters, and you're going to have to resolve that dramatic tension. So this is a high-level overview of what all these papers are doing to help you organize what it is you're doing when you're writing them. And so each one of you is thinking, hmm, I'm going to have to sit down and try this, <laughs> right? I think what might be yeah. useful is to have, like, there's a group you were saying to, like, have a group where we specifically talk about these concepts, like bringing what we yeah, wrote. Yeah, I think then, that would be great. And then I revisit, exactly like, am I doing do. that? Um, yeah. Yeah, that, that's what I would recommend is your next step is try it out. Mm -hmm. Try it out with your stuff. Read each other's stuff. See how you can apply this. So, next meeting. Yes. The yeah. difference that I personally have, with, because um, my research is in humanities, mm -hmm. uh, for example, um, for me, the second model was working, theory building, for example. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. what I did my mm -hmm. integrated paper on, and still I had trouble. Some things are maybe I know it wrongly or I understand it wrongly, were not applicable in the sense when you said in the background you only use things that relate to your constructs and nothing more, you exclude things. I mean, in humanities you tend to write your you know, background and introduction in a very flamboyant way. Mm -hmm. In a way mm -hmm. you, start, you try to show off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You don't try to exclude. So that's why, for example, I mean, you've, when got, I, you've got to exclude something. Yes, though. but that's a way, I mean... I mean you, don't, you don't include Agamemnon and the Third Reich. No, but... Um, Unless no. you're talking about Agamemnon and the Third Reich. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't imagine why you would be. No, but uh, the thing is that... that um, then the norms, you're right, the norms for different fields are going to be kind of different. Yeah, uh, that's the, um, the, lim the limiting part becomes difficult for me. So, yeah. for example, that's... You know, the stages, etc. It's a useful... So, so actually doing an outline... Mm -hmm. and writing it as a two-pager, mm -hmm. start with the bare bones. And then you can start, it's like starting with the Christmas tree and then you can add the ornaments on it. Mm -hmm. But make sure you know what you're trying to say first. And knowing what you're trying to say is enormously, screenwriters have a lot of trouble figuring out what they're trying to say. Mm -hmm. the, the, uh, the guys who wrote uh, Fiddler on the Roof, it took them months to figure out what the movie was about, and they could not write Fiddler on the Roof until they figured out what it was about. So the guy who was producing it, the guys who were writing it, the guys who were producing it, they'd meet periodically and they'd say, okay, okay, what's this movie about? Well, it's about this guy who has a lot of daughters and he has to marry them. Like, no, no, that's not what the movie's about. Go back, and they go back and they say, okay, so the guy's living in poverty and you know he's, he's discriminated against, he's a member of minority group. No, that's not what the movie's about. 
So they went around and around and around until they finally figured out what the movie's about. Anybody remember what the opening song is? Tradition. It's about tradition and about the tradition being under stress as you see the changing conditions. And then if you look at it from that perspective, everything that happens with those three oldest daughters is about various ways of those traditions being reinforced or breaking down. That's what the movie's about. Figuring out what the movie is about, because after that, oh, the rest of it was easy. Then they could go write it. It just took them months to figure out what the movie was about. Mm -hmm. If you can do the two-pager and you know what it's about, then you can add the songs, you can add the dancing, you can add the costumes. <laughs> but first you've got to figure out what the movie's about. It's a non-trivial problem. I've, I've found in writing other things, uh, I think that it's finding the key to the piece, that you find the one thing that if you take it out, it comes apart. The whole rest of it falls apart. Yeah. And yeah, that is the hardest thing. To, yep. Yeah. That's the thing you wake up in the middle of the night. And go, ah! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 So I'm, I'm acting like I've just given you guys the answers. I haven't. What I've done is I've given you a hammer and a saw and said, yeah, go make a cathedral. Mm -hmm. I know. But at least you have a hammer and a saw. <laughs> and so there's a couple things you might want to do. Start writing, trying to use this. The, the, to ladder up to that, if that's too big a leap, take some things out of the literature and start analyzing them like this. Diagram them this way. Which things are working well? How did they do this? So if you actually diagram them, then you can see how they're being done. What I've done is I've actually, in The Wizard of Oz, I've drawn the curtain back and said, here's this guy behind the curtain. Here's what he's doing. Now go see if you can see what he's doing in some additional pieces. And then get better and better at doing it in your own. More questions? You guys just ready for the fun. <laughs> But you're even looking like you don't think it's all that much fun. It is one more question, yeah? Sorry, I just have a very kind of stupid question. Oh, they're, yeah. not, they're not stupid. So I'm just still a little bit confused what's the difference between question and the problem. Since problem is more broad mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and question is more concrete. So so the the problem is so if you think about the, the large number of MIM students, the problem is we've got a lot more MIM students than we had before. Now that's a problem, it's also an opportunity. The question, you can start with broad questions and get narrow, progressively narrower until you find one that you can actually get your arms around and finish. Because you know the definition of a good thesis <laughs> is one that is completed. So one of the problems that students often have is they take on too big a question. So we could say, we've got a lot more MIM students. The big question is, how do we scale up while maintaining quality experience? That's got a lot of pieces to it. We are not, you know how you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. That's a big elephant. Let's divide it up into some little pieces. Putting in specializations is one bite. We think that if we put in specializations, this will help us with scale up with this large number of students because it will provide information to the students in a, a more tailored information, a structured set of things they can do without having to do individual advising. Because if you have to do individual advising for 200 students, the student services office is not going to survive. So, specializations is a way of helping with advising. It also, we think, helps with internship placements and job placements because it provides information to the students. It also provides information to prospective employers. It may create community. I don't know. That's possible. So now we've got three different questions. Does it help limit the amount of, of time we have to spend advising? The time the students have to spend trying to find advising appointments? Does it help with internships and um, 
Employment is the second question. That's actually two parts of that question. You could say those are two questions. And then does it actually affect the development of community would be a third question. And then even within that, you can have sub-questions. So it helps you to start with the high-level question and work your way down to the sub-questions. And you can start with the high-level question, divide it up into sub-questions, and then figure out which one of these is your thesis and which one of these is later stuff. So you might have a dissertation that's one little question, but you do it in a couple of different settings. Or a dissertation that says, I'm going to take three little questions. Or you can have a dissertation that's just, you know, fairly narrow or three unrelated questions. After you finished your dissertation and you graduated, here's now your research agenda, working through the rest of those freaking questions. So you start with, here's what we're going to do for this piece, and that helps you say, okay, and that stuff I'm going to do later. I don't have to do everything in my thesis. This is the thesis, the other stuff I'm doing later. Take it off of your plate for what you're doing right now. And that part of that is a negotiation with your advisor. How big is your thesis? Which of these questions interests you and your advisor? So in my experience, every student, by the time they graduate, hates their thesis topic. If you pick one that you love, you will spend more time loving it and less time hating it. The ratio will be better. If you start with something you don't like to begin with, you're going to come to hate it sooner, and you're going to have a really bad love-it-to-hate-it relationship. The ratio is going to be off. So pick something you're really interested in, something you really care about that your advisor is also interested in and really cares about. Because if they don't care about it, you're not going to get the time and attention from them that you would get if they're interested. So part of that's a negotiation about what your dissertation or your thesis is going to look like, what's a reasonable amount to do. There are a lot of questions out there. They're all really interesting. Bound what you're doing so you can complete it. But feel free to write out all of them. That really, that helps me enormously. Because I can write them all out and say, okay, I'm doing this one. But I haven't forgotten about the other ones. They're still there. Those are called post-dissertation research. Not to be done now, to be done later. Okay? Helpful? Not helpful. You won't know until you give it a try. <laughs> Are you going to uh, shoot the um, shoot the slides out? Uh, yeah, Diane's got the slides. Did you sign up? Oh, I, I, did. Did. I did. Okay, so sign in, and I'm going to. I start outlining the argument based on what they've written, and trying to draw the model myself. And that's when I pull out this stuff and say, "Here's what I think your argument is." Here's what I think you want your argument to be. Here's what this section ought to be doing, which is why AEs tell me that I'm a very good constructive reviewer, because I tell them what they could do to fix it. Doing that, you can also figure out whether their data could possibly answer their research question. If their data can't answer their research question, there's no way for them to get there from here. They're going to have to come up with a different research question or come up with entirely different data, which is kind of a different paper. Then the review is, this is an important topic, but these data can't get you there. Or this is really interesting data, but it's not going to actually illuminate the thing that you think it's going to illuminate. So you need to have an entirely different front end to it. So these are ways of finding problems because this is an hourglass structure. The introduction, you're going to be fairly broad. We're all going to die. Scale and scope. This is a pretty broad thing. The introduction is going to be fairly broad. The importance of the issue. The background, you're getting a little bit narrower. We're talking about these particular variables and their behavior. Not the entire world. These main characters. 
There's a lot of characters we don't need to know about. Uh, the hypotheses are even more specific. Right? The method's going to be quite specific. The results are going to be getting a little bit broader. The results should relate directly back to your hypotheses. So when I'm writing the results section, I copy and paste the hypotheses. Here's the result for hypothesis one. Here's the result for hypothesis two. Here's the result for hypothesis three. There's no need to be tricky here. Your reviewers are probably trying to read this and write the review while they're watching the football game. <laughs> there is no advantage to making it hard for them to find stuff. Well, okay, they're not actually watching the football game. They're, they're watching soccer. But, yeah, <laughs> I'm just saying, they're, they're not, they're not going to want to work really hard. Make it easy for them. This is not great literature. It should be fairly simple for them to follow. The discussion is confirming or disconfirming the background, parallelism with the literature review, right? And doing things in the same order in each of these is helpful, right? So start with the things that are going to be on the left-hand side of your model and work to the right. <laughs> and then when you just do the hypotheses that way, the analysis, you get the results, do hypothesis one first, hypothesis two second, hypothesis, do the results. Now we're going to do the things on the left and work our way to the right. Stay in the same order. It just makes it cognitively easier for the reader. Anyone at HCI knows this makes it cognitively easier. Um, don't make it harder just because you're writing a paper. I have a question. Mm -hmm. So we're talking, with all of this, this is the big, final, wonderful paper that you give in and you defend and then they say, yay, you did a good job, you get to graduate, yay. What should we be really focusing on in terms of these sections for the proposal? I was very mean, I'm very mean to my doctoral students. <laughs> <laughs> my, it depends a little bit on, on what proposals look like here at Maryland in the high school. And there are two theories about proposals. One is, you give me five pages, and if you know, you've got a good idea, it's got a beat, you can dance to it, you know, see what you come up with. And that's fine, in which case you should say, here's the importance of the issue, here's what's been done on this before, here's uh, what I'm going to do, and here's five to ten references so that we can situate it in the field. This is when I was a program officer at the National Science Foundation, we call that the two-pager. It's two pages, it says here's why, what the problem is, here's the need for this work, and here's, here's what's already done, here's what I'm going to do, and five to ten references so we know what intellectual community you're coming from. And that was what we would tell prospective PIs to send us, and we tell them whether this was going to be a good fit for our program, or if it should go to a different program. It's more likely to get funded somewhere else. That's a quick two-page. It's really hard to write a two-pager, by the way. So I'm saying this like this is really easy. It's mm -hmm. not. Yeah. If you can write a really good five-page proposal, you're actually going to kind of have to have sorted out a lot of this stuff. The better you can sort this out, the shorter the proposal you can write. Now the other alternative, the other version is, you write me your entire thesis up through the method section. And the results section, you write the results section with, instead of the actual results, XXX, where you think results are going to be and you give me a mock-up of the tables that you're going to include in your results section without any actual data in them because then I know that you actually know what you're going to do and that you can do these analyses and those analyses will test your hypotheses. The reason why I was mean enough to make my students do this and I used to make them do this in the research methods class I taught for their proposals and um, also for this, the um, statistical, uh, the statistics class I taught, I'd actually make them make these things up. And here's why. 
I worked my way through my graduate program tutoring statistics and doing statistical analyses for people who, this was back before we had point and click statistical packages, they were command based and they were on mainframes. So we were doing this with Fortran formatting and BMDP and it was, it was kind of, it was a specialized skill. The number of people who came to me and said, here are my data, analyze them, and there was no way to answer their questions with the data that they had. They had spent a year or two years or three years collecting data that were not going to be analyzable to answer their questions. If you can write a complete proposal and you can tell me that you know what analyses you're going to do and you know what these tables are going to look like, does two things. One is you know that you can get there from here. The other is, although it's not a legal contract, it is in many ways an implied contract between you and your advisor that says, if I do these things, I get my degree. If all you've got is two pages, there are a lot of ways that you can do stuff that your advisor says, that wasn't really what I was thinking you were going to do. If you've got a very complete proposal, even if the results don't come out the way you thought they were going to come out, and this depends a little bit on, on whether your advisor is saying, if you do these things, you've shown that you can undertake independent research to conclusion. Or are they saying you have got to have a publishable result? So this is a conversation to have with your advisor. There are two schools of thought on this. One is keep it loose, keep it general. But I would still say is you've really got to have answers to these questions to be able to write a good two-pager. The other is be as complete and explicit as you can and have a conversation with your advisor about, well, what if it doesn't work out? Do I still get my, my degree? Or do I keep going after this until I've actually got something that has significant results? In, in looking at the idea of basically uh, doing the first part of the thesis as the proposal, it's strikingly like the chapter and outline thing you would do as a proposal for a book. Mm -hmm. uh, especially for a novel. And you write the first three chapters and you write the outline exactly. and the rest of the novel's going to go. And they decide whether or not to, um, to green light it based on that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. And as I say, this is, this is, I'm saying this like this is easy. Screenwriters make a lot of money. The screenwriters for Star Wars made a lot of money. This is not easy stuff. But if you look at the structure of it, you can provide some self-guidance about where to go with this and how to move forward. And you can help each other in terms of your writing support group to say, okay, I'm reading your introduction. Is this a, it has long been thought that? Or is this a scale and scope problem? Or I'm not understanding the dramatic tension here. Or, you know, should I put this in my background section, my literature review? Oh, wait a minute, that's actually not relevant for what I'm doing here. Or I've changed my design, now I'm not going to do this. Oh, okay, now I know what to take out of the background section. So, Getting these things, that these are essentially heuristics to guide you in what you're doing. And it could be a thesis, it could be uh, uh, a research report. If you're just doing a digging into data thing, here's a report of what we found. Everything's going to follow this structure. So I, I remember talking to a friend of mine who was having trouble writing, figuring out how to write a report on the, the state of the college, who was a dean at the time. And the previous dean came by, and, oh, how are things going? Oh, I'm having trouble figuring out how to structure this report. He said, well, you can go with the old standby. What do you mean the old standby? Well, with pride and past accomplishments and concern for the future. Oh, my God, that is the old standby, <laughs> right? It's amazing how many reports you can now write and read. And he was like, oh, yeah, they all say that. Um, when I worked at the National Science Foundation, the senior people would come by each one of the review panels as the, the, the experts come in and review all the proposals and make recommendations. They want to come in and say hello. They, 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 um, when you leave the airplane after a, a flight and the pilot comes on and say, 
and you know, we, we appreciate you flying with us. We know you have a choice of airlines. The pilots call that kissing the passengers goodbye. So the division directors at the National Science Foundation will kiss the panelists hello. So they come in and they have a few words with them, you know. Um, the guy I used to work for was, was the, um, above the division directors. I remember asking, well, what are you going to say with this, you know, this is like a big National Academy of Science study, what are you going to say? And so I'm going to go with the usual. What's the usual? You say, thank you for being here. You're really great. Here's what we're hoping to get out of this. Thank you for being here. <laughs> and then you leave. <laughs> <All right. laughs> yeah, you're going to be watching these these uh, these talks when people come in and and at, at convocation, at graduation, at thank you for being here. You're all great. Here's what we're hoping to get out of this. Thank you for being here. And you're done. So looking at this high level structure, it doesn't necessarily help you fill in, it doesn't necessarily fill in the details, but at least you can test what you're doing against these purposes as you move forward. Is this actually doing what this section ought to be doing? And it keeps you from wandering down the rabbit hole and down a lot of blind alleys and putting in stuff that's not going to be relevant. It helps figure out what to not put in, which is almost as important as knowing what to put in. It should provide some guideposts. More questions? I'm sensing more questions over there. Logical consistency between these sections is the key to creating a convincing piece of research and influences the decision making. You don't want misdirection. Don't put something in the literature review that's not going to be in the research model and not going to be in the results and not going to be in the discussion. You're just going to confuse your readers. Don't get to the end of it and not get the princess out of danger. People are going to feel like it's somehow incomplete. And there's a good chance they won't be able to articulate what's bothering them. They won't be able to tell you They'll just have the sense that something's wrong. Any of you guys watch Babylon 5? Yes. <laughs> so I have a friend who generally is not a big science fiction fan. I was visiting her at one point, and she was absolutely hooked on Babylon 5. And I asked her, I said, Kyrie, what are you doing watching Babylon 5? This is not the kind of thing you'd like. She says, I don't know what it is about it, but it's enormously satisfying. I said, you know, the guy who wrote it, insisted that they could not start filming until he had written all five years of the scripts. Yep, that's why. And so I, of course, had to watch it. So I watched it. It was in reruns. I watched it all the way through. And then I watched it all the way through again, and I figured out what he was doing. It's a common literary technique called foreshadowing. Foreshadowing is where you have kind of a toss-away line that is getting you subconsciously thinking about something that may not be happening for another year or two into the series. So if the character says, you know, they walked into the bathroom, which was tall and narrow as though it were a coffin on end. Oh, someone's going to die. <laughs> Right? They're foreshadowing, Coffin is foreshadowing something about death. Babylon 5 was foreshadowing, that's why he wouldn't let them start filming until they had all five years of scripts, because he was foreshadowing stuff years out. But also, he also referenced other cultural things. Like, he referenced, he named things from, like, Lord of the Rings. He oh, named yeah. something Kazadu. Oh, yeah. And which oh, yeah. really is interesting, because then you have that, that subtle implication, too. Yeah, but that, my, my friend Connie Marie, that'd be lost oh. on her. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, she's not a so, real. You, no, you're absolutely right. It, 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 they've had those kind of cultural touchstones and memes for that particular community. Yeah. But, so as I say, the, the logical consistency is very important. Leaving someone with a princess in danger where you don't actually tie it up in a ribbon and say clearly they're out of danger is going to leave them feeling unsatisfied somehow. And they probably won't be able to tell you why. Conway couldn't tell me that it was foreshadowing. I couldn't tell it was foreshadowing until I went through and watched it the second time. 
back to back. Okay. <laughs> <Anyone like it>? <laughs> <laughs> So there's some advantages to massing. <laughs> right, so be consistent across the sections is really important in terms of the structure here. Theory building format. So these are the same pieces, but they're in kind of a different order. The introduction is going to be the importance of the issue. You're going to talk more, though, about the phenomena to be investigated and talk about the research question and contribution up in that section in a lot of detail. And if, if you want to see really good models of how this is done, almost anything by Wanda Orlikowski. O-R-L-I-K-O-W-S-K-I. -I, Wanda Orlikowski. She has a lot of qualitative theory building stuff. O-R-L-I-K-O-W-S-K-I. She has a lot of qualitative theory building stuff, or, or the book by Golden Lock, or, yeah, Lock and Golden Bill, the characters, or the, the Karens who did the Sage book on writing qualitative research. They help a lot with what's the structure of qualitative theory building stuff. The method is going to be why do we need to build theory? Why is current theory inadequate? What does it mean need to know? A lot about the site selection. Why are we going to look here? Why not look somewhere else? And this is partly, um, they're going to draw, almost certainly draw a lot on a book by Yin on case research, where he says, what makes a good case? Not just that it's the easiest to get to, but it should be of some theoretical relevance. It's an extreme case. It's a very typical exemplar. I've got two cases, and they're of theoretical interest because the theory would predict one thing for one and something else for the other. Yeah. Would this be? Um, would this be also be site selection? Would be okay. So this is the problem. It was seen in this in this case, and it was seen two years later, and it was seen three years later, and in this most recent one, it's still being seen. So, so yeah, site selection so. is what are we going to look at in a lot of detail. Oh, okay, so different thing. So it, it may be that you're going to say, here are all the, it depends on whether you're doing in-depth work in one area or whether you're doing stuff across multiple cases. Okay. What are you going to do to actually build your theory? So, so which so where, where are you going to draw observations from is the question to build the theory. Okay. Unless you're Einstein, you're just going to sit down and say, wow, relativity, cool. If you're actually going to be doing it based on some data, how do you decide where to look? Okay, so I'm just trying to make sure I understand because mm -hmm. this is sort of what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Is So I'm saying these four cases are indicative over the, of the problem over time, but this one is not because of these characteristics that make it unusual. You're, yeah, absolutely, you're bounding it. Okay. Right, so you're going to say, I'm going to look at these because they're of some particular interest and not these others because they're not of particular interest. So either okay. they're not similar or they're too similar. Okay. Why would I have to look at all of these? They're the same darn thing. So I'm just going to look at one that's particularly good at it. I'm going to look at this one and compare it to this one because we think this one's going to act differently because the people who are doing independent program plans are just probably going to be weird independent people and the project manager people are going to be groupy people so we're going to compare them to each other because our theory says that how groupy you are is going to determine how you whether or not you're going to build a community okay so pick one that's very groupy and one that's likely to be very ungroupy picking project management versus strategic management of information well they're probably equally groupy so why do it twice Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So again, talks a lot about case selection and why you would, there's a big argument in the literature, Kathleen Eisen, Eisenhart um, has weighed in on this about whether a single case is ever useful or if you need multiple cases to be able to say anything of, of interest. Yin does allow that single cases can be useful but only if they are a particular exemplar of something. This is the quintessential something. Mm. And it may not actually be able to tell you much about the theory. 
You can't test a theory with a single case. Eisenhart will argue with him. It's not a cut and dried area. But the issue of site selection is an important one. The issue of data sources and data analysis is an important one in theory building. Because what you find may be very strongly determined by where you look. So you need to justify why you look there versus somewhere else. You know the, the old joke about the, um, the guy who's looking, it's late at night, he's out in the parking lot and he's, he's looking underneath the lamp post, searching for something. Another guy comes up and says, you know, what are you looking for? He says, I've lost my keys in the car. So I'll help you look for him. So they're looking and looking and looking and they can't find him anywhere. And the guy finally says, are you sure you dropped him here? And he says, oh no, I dropped him over there by the car. So why are you looking over here? He says, because the light's better here. Right? Site selection. Are you looking there just because the light's better there? We could get the data for this one. That's not a really good theoretical justification. It may be all you're left for, but you need to actually describe why this site. If that's what you're left with, why is this an appropriate place to look? If the keys are over there, this is not going to do you much good. You have to explain to me which keys are here and why you think those keys are going to be here. And how this is going to be relevant. I mean, this is, actually, I kid you not, took an act of Congress in the 1970s to get the National Institutes of Health to demand that all medical trials include women. Up until that time, the medical trials did not include women. This includes the medical trials for treatments for breast cancer. It did not include women. Mm -hmm. Yes. What about things for like cervical cancer? I'm, How would they do research on that? It was absolutely uh, preposterous. Okay. So you cannot make the argument for your site selection that this is appropriate. Make the argument explicit. And what are the data sources? What's the data analysis? Then your results the general variables in their behavior. So this is going to be a paradigm, a model, a story that you build. This is your high-level boxes and arrows. Then you do a detailed dive, a deep dive into those concept categories. So what are the contents of all, all each of those boxes described in a fair amount of detail with an illustrative example? The discussion is going to be that summary of the theoretical frame, its relation to the existing literature. So I've now developed this new theory. It's related to some known things in the literature, but I haven't duplicated it entirely or else I don't get my degree. I mean, I don't get published. <laughs> Show that it, the application of these other theories to the study data. Um, do you have an emerging concept? How is this related to what's called the nomological net? What's already known about how things are related to each other? Now I've got new concepts. How do we see them within the larger context of the theories that we know about? This is, I've found a new quark. And here's how this quark relates to the other quarks that we knew about. You don't just say, I found a new quark and I named him Charm. Duh. <laughs> you explain how it's related to the other stuff that's already known about and what's new and, and interesting. The conclusion is the importance of our answer to theory and practice. So you've got the same pieces. They're in a different order with some different emphases, some, other, some things you need to explain in more detail than you do for a theory testing piece. And some things you have to explain in less detail than for a theory testing piece. Yes? Yeah, I have a question, so maybe I missed. Uh, so we don't need background part here? Um, you actually bring in the background part. You actually, the background part winds up, um, the part that's what's known about it theoretically already, it winds up distributed through this. So it may be partly in the site selection. It may be partly in the phenomena to in be investigated. It may be partly in the, the uh, general variables and behavior. So it winds up getting sprinkled through this. A lot of it winds up down in the relation to existing theory, that last pink part in the discussion. So a lot of it winds up down there, depending on the extent to which your theory building is following grounded theory. 
grounded theory says I'm coming in with a clean slate and I'm just going to see what's there. And then the concepts are going to emerge from what I see. Then you don't really say much about what's known about it already because that's going to taint what you're going to see. So if you're taking a theory from one realm of the world, one body of literature, and you're saying, you know what, this could actually help us over here. So I'm going to take this theory, I'm going to plop it down here, and I'm going to analyze it and see, does this make sense in this situation, in these. That's theory building in this area, but you're taking it from over here. So that... But is it, a, is it, is it extension? extension? It is a theory extension, and does that follow theory building, or does that follow the theory testing? It's probably going to look more like theory testing. What I didn't talk about uh, when I said this illuminates their character, that is part of theory building. right? So you've got an existing theory. You find something surprising. Now you're going to modify the existing theory based on your new knowledge. So it's circular. Here's what we knew before. We did some stuff. And now we've learned something more. <laughs> Right? So I said, Han Solo, we now know that Han Solo is not just an uncaring mercenary. <laughs> so do we now have to modify our theory to take that into account? And if our theory said Han Solo is a mercenary, then yeah, finding out he's not, we're going to have to modify our theory. So that your results may actually lead to theory extension, theory modification. Or you may just say, you know what? We found out it works here just like it works there. There's a thing which I, I think is relevant to this, and maybe it's not, but I think it is. Um, and these in the Star Wars thing. Uh, <laughs> Excellent. I watched the first three Star Wars movies and thought that it was the character arc of Luke Skywalker. It's, it's Luke Skywalker going from farm boy to a uh, galactic hero the same as day. And then George Lucas released the other three movies, and I looked at it and I realized to my horror that it's actually, you know, that, that you can make a compelling case that it's actually the character arc of Darth Vader. Um, you know, and which you had conf confirming evidence at the end where he felt compelled to change the actor portraying Vader at the end of the, at the end of uh, Return of the Jedi to, be the, the actor who played him in the first three, in the, the, the new three movies, um, which changed the movies for me radically. Um, and so it's sort of like realizing that you have a different model which provides a better fit to the data than the previous model that you had. <laughs> that would be a theory building. And so you may have started with one theory, mm -hmm. and then you find these different these different results than mm -hmm. what you expected. And you go, oh, wow, you know, I'm really going to have to reconceptualize this. And now we need a better theory. Here's how what I've discovered helps change our existing theory to be able to better accommodate this. Okay. Exactly. Yep. Darn that, George. I know. Every time okay. I give this talk, I learn more about Star Wars. It's great. The guy was brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Can I say I'm a little hesitant to see what Disney's going to do with the final three? Oh, my gosh. Uh, yeah, I, I know. know. I know. Okay. Summary. Solve an interesting problem. Have the hypotheses, or you might have, in, instead of them listed, the hypotheses are very specific. You can have something that's more general but gets at that same idea. So you may have propositions, right? Propositions are more general than hypotheses. Or if you're doing theory building, you don't actually have the hypotheses in there. So hypothesis um, necessary for theory testing, but not that necessary for, for theory, theory building. Theory testing, yeah, they, they've got, because the hypotheses in theory building what you're doing is you're saying, now I understand the situation. Now I can do boxes and arrows. But the, essentially, the, uh, the product, the deliverable, the thing that you're providing at the end of the paper for theory building is now you're giving people the boxes and arrows. 
And so the arrows are the things that they will use to create hypotheses in the future research. So for those paper, um, it's better to include those potential hypotheses in the discussion. I'll, I'll show you. I'll show you what it looks like for theory building when we get to the okay. end. Okay. So bear with me on this part so that I can tell you more about what I mean by each of these sections. Because once you really understand what each of these sections are, for theory building, I'll show you how they're put together somewhat differently. But each of these sections is still doing the same thing. You just put them in a different order. Okay? Because this is, this is all very vague stuff that I've just showed you here. This doesn't actually help you sit down and write anything, right? You're being very polite and you're all looking like, yeah, right, this is excellent. Why did Diane get us out here at this time? <laughs> but wait, there's more. Because here's the part that, that, um, that I got excited about, is actually thinking about this in terms of literature. So if you think about that first section, that introduction, where you're explaining why it's interesting and important and what the question is, what you're really doing is you're clarifying why we should care. And in the literature, in fiction literature, this is called setting it up as dramatic tension. Good literature starts with dramatic tension. So in Star Wars, it starts with a princess who needs saving. In the murder mystery, you find a dead body. This creates dramatic tension. We need to know why there are dead bodies. Somebody's got to deal with this. I'm Pride and Prejudice, you've got five unmarried daughters with no money. This is dramatic tension. In Bollywood, clearly this man and this unmarried man, this unmarried woman, they've, they've, they've got to get married. How is this going to happen? In Jackie Chan movies, we've got these perfectly well-behaved, upright citizens, and they're being terrorized by thugs. Well, this is just not right. This, you want to come in and fight? <laughs> I know you want Jackie to. Chan movies. <laughs> <laughs> and what was the other structure? Oh, Star Wars, I heard. That's what Star Wars. Yeah. My <laughs> this is this is how to write your thesis. Is that you're writing the screenplay to Star Wars? Star, Star Wars Episode Four. Or <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. oh, a New yeah. Hope. No, yes. no, episode, episode Four. Okay, yes. good. Because I mean, really, the first three don't exist in my mind. No, no, no. They're not even Star Wars. <laughs> okay, Absolutely. Not. Thank you. Yeah. Right. No I agree. Get along so well. Uh, All right. Sorry. Guys. <laughs> so. The first section is supposed to be explaining why it's interesting and important, what the question is. We see this over and over again in literature, right? This is the establishing shot. It's one of the problems with Silicon Valley. The establishing shot is when they come in on the helicopter, and you see that they are in, you see the Statue of Liberty, you know that they're in New York. You see Washington Monument, you know that they're in DC, right? You see the Sears Tower, you know that they're in Chicago. Part of the problem, with Silicon Valley for establishing shots is there is no landmark. If it's San Francisco, it's the Golden Gate Bridge, right? Well, you guys know this. So um, you've got the establishing shot, and pretty quickly you've got to establish some kind of dramatic tension of some sort. In your thesis, you want in the opening sentences to be setting up a particular problem to raise a question in people's minds. You want some dramatic tension. And as a reader, when you read that opening sentence, the question in your mind should be, uh, am I interested in finding out the answer to these questions? So, as we look at this, I just pulled these off my shelf one afternoon. Um, pull these off of uh, my shelf and look at what are the first sentences in literature for some of these things. This one is, my sister Kwan believes she has yin eyes. Does that raise a question for you? did for me. I don't know what yin eyes are. She sees those who have died and now dwell in the world of yin, goes to leave the mist just to visit her kitchen on Balboa Street in San Francisco. Does that create some interest, some dramatic tension? Here is one, the flute clan boy was the first to see it. See what? He stopped and stared. Somebody lost a boot, he said. Even from where he stood, at least 15 yards further down the trail, Albert Lomatoa could see that nobody had lost the boot. The boot had been placed, not dropped. 
There's just all kinds of questions in my mind from this one. Um, so, in nonfiction, there are two ways that you're going to set up dramatic tension in your first paragraph. You have two choices. One is, it has long been thought that, fill in the blank, but actually, something else. The other alternative is scale and scope. This is going to be big, it's disastrous, we're all going to die if we don't do something. It's a data deluge, big data. We're going to have to deal with this. Pick one or the other of those, that's how you're going to be setting up dramatic tension. <laughs> Here's one from nonfiction. An olive, to many, is no more than a humble lump at the bottom of a martini. Yet a closer look reveals a portrait in miniature of the richest parts of our world. It has long been thought that, but actually, pretty good, huh? Here's something from published research. So the authors are saying, we begin this paper with what we believe is a telling observation. The field of information systems, which is premised on the centrality of information technology in everyday life, has not deeply engaged its core subject matter, the information technology artifact. It has long been thought that we are dealing with IT, but actually we're not dealing with IT. Uh, here's, a, here's a scale and scope. With the increased availability of data collected from the internet and other sources and the implementation of enterprise-wide databases, the amount of data that companies possess is growing at a phenomenal rate. Hence, it becomes increasingly important for the companies to be able to better manage their databases. We're all going to die. <laughs> <laughs> Here's something that I did not review positively. The dramatic tension. Information technology is defined as... There is no dramatic tension in starting with the definition. Yes. All right, this is putting you to sleep. Don't do this so, setting up dramatic tension, raise some questions, put your princess in danger. <laughs> it has long been thought that, but actually, or scale and scope. We're dealing with all sorts of trouble here, and we're going to have to sort this out. Problematize it if necessary. There are a couple of ways of problematizing things. Explain why existing knowledge is not adequate. It's not enough to say nobody has ever studied this before. It's possible that nobody has ever studied this before because it's not worth studying. Just because nobody's done it doesn't mean it's a good idea. It is a good idea if we haven't looked at it before, but we're all going to die if we don't. Or if we've looked at it, but we've looked at it differently and we've missed some important features. So there's a nice book by Karen Locke and Karen Golden Biddle about problematizing research. And it's actually a really nice book about qualitative research in general. It's got a whole chapter on problematization, for those of you who would like to. Does, does Locke have any on it? Yes, it does. I think it's a Sage, a book out of Sage. Um, what, what don't we know that will be important? What will we know or do differently once we have this new knowledge? It's important things to have answers to these questions as you're writing your paper. Leads us to the background. In the background section, this is where you're going to identify your main characters. So this is where I at constructs and variables, and you're going to review what's known about them that's relevant to your question. In literature, this is called character development. This is what we know about Jackie Chan, about James Bond, Hercule Poirot, Pride and Prejudice. You've got five daughters. One is sweet, one is sharp, one is flirty, one is follower, one is inept. In Star Wars, who's the valiant one? Who's the dedicated one, the wise one, the mercenary one, the muscle? <laughs> so Chewbacca is going to be the muscle. Han Solo is the mercenary. Han Solo is the mercenary. Yoda's the wise. Yoda's the wise. In in Star Wars four, I don't think we have Yoda. We have Obi Wan. Yeah, 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 yeah that's right. Yeah. 
Yeah, Yoda's even better, but Obi-Wan's the, the wise one. And I, guess I think Princess Leia's pretty dedicated. So Luke has got to be the... Luke's got to be the valiant one. <laughs> right? Um, and and uh, Luke's pretty, pretty scientifically adept. You know, he's fixing all the machines on his, his aunt and uncle's farm. So he's a science guy. In research, then, this is going to culminate in that theoretical model, the boxes and arrows. So your literature review is saying for each of your main characters, each of your constructs is a main character, what's known about them that's relevant for How many toes does Han Solo have? We don't know because it's not relevant to the movie. <laughs> if it's not relevant to the movie, you don't put it in. If it's something you know about, a construct you're using, but it's not relevant to your study, you don't put it in. Character development is about putting in the stuff that people need to know to be able to understand what's going to be happening in the movie. You don't have to put everything in. In Murder Mysteries, you put some extra things in just to confuse people. But uh, that, that's the, the, uh, the misdirection part in Murder Mysteries. Okay, hypotheses are about predicting the behavior in a situation based on the model. So, if it's possible to have hypotheses, if you can get that specific. For example, if I said, you know, Joe Smith will join the uprising against the emperor and help attack the fort, do you, does this grip you? Do you care about Joe Smith? Do you think he's going to? You don't care, and you don't know. You don't know Joe Smith from anybody. It's not a, at all interesting, nor are you able to predict what's going to happen. Han Solo will help the rebels destroy the Death Squad, the Death Star. Do you care? If you saw Star Wars, yeah, you really did care. Because <laughs> you had character yeah. development. Mm -hmm. Without the character development and without the princess in danger, you don't care. But you've set up the dramatic tension. You've got the character development. Han Solo is an uncaring mercenary. So based on his background, do you think he's going to help the Rebel rebels destroy the Death, Squad or the Death Star? He's already been paid. He's been paid, and he's left. He and Chewbacca have blown out of there. Hmm. Now it becomes an interesting question. Your thesis should be written similarly. <laughs> we should care what the answer is to these things. To care about this, you need to know about Han Solo. You need to know about the rebels and the uprising. You need to know about the Empire and Darth Vader. You need to know about the Death Star. So you can predict whether he will or will not be a mercenary or a caring idealist. Then you get to your method section. Your method section is essentially metadata. It's describing what you did to answer your research question. You need to provide enough detail that someone else could replicate it. So who provided the data? Where did you get the data from? Those, when you measured the things in those boxes, where did those data come from? What were your operational definitions? What were the measures that they, you, you used on a scale of 1 to 5? Right, the number of the, the um, what were we talking about? Advising. Advising was measured as the number of uh, students who requested particular individual, or I don't know, we'll come up with some measures. Data were collected from students. We, we uh, surveyed all the MIM students and asked them, during your time at the MIM program, how many hours of advising did, did you ever go to a group session? I don't know, we'll come up with something. So, who provided the data? What was used in the study? What were the materials? What were the instruments? What was the equipment? And then what did they do or what was done to them? What were the procedures? This is enough information that somebody else could replicate it. In literature, this is setting up your drama's climactic scene. In Star Wars, there's that scene before the battle with the Death Star. The, the, the Death Star. We have analyzed the Death Star plans delivered in this droid and found this fatal flaw. We need to fire into this vent before the Death Star clears the moon. Well, that's only, you know, two meters. And 
and we hear, um, well, I used to, to get swung on womp rats with uh, <laughs> my laser from that distance. It's easy. I can hit that. Uh, and then here are the fighter plane squad leaders. So this is where we know that uh, Han Solo is, has gone. He and Chewbacca have been paid off and they've left. We know we've got the gold squad, the orange squad, the red blue squad. squad, the red squad. You guys are serious geeks. This is great. <laughs> we know that they're going to try and get to this air shaft and they're going to have to get a, a shot that's got to be perfect for it to happen. There's even one more thing we know. We also know that the data on that droid was provided by informants, some of whom paid for giving them that data with their lives. So we know, we know method of how the data we got there. We know the method of how the data got there. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So your method section should be covering all of these things. When you say, what do I have to include? You've got to include the stuff that will help us understand the action as we watch it unfold. Because the action is going to unfold. We set the scene with enough detail that we know what's going on, and we can predict how those variables are going to behave. We can follow the action and the hypotheses. The results section, that's your climactic scene. This is where the behavior of the characters in this setting is going to resolve the dramatic tension. It's going to illuminate the characters' personalities. Luke is choosing between spirituality and science. He turns off his targeting computer to use the force. So now we start to understand the central challenge facing Luke. And that helps us understand the things that happened earlier in the movie as they set up his character development. So he was actually in charge of all the equipment on his aunt and uncle's farm. But he also really cared about this little droid and was curious about Obi-Wan Kenobi. So he's got the spiritual side, he's got the science side, and he's trying to deter, to decide between spirituality and logic and, and control of his emotions. That's his character arc. Han Solo? You guys have seen Star Wars. We don't want to have a spoiler alert here, right? <laughs> Is Han Solo just an uncaring mercenary? No. No. No, he's a good guy. <laughs> he comes back. Yeah, he comes back. So this is teaching us about human nature. In your thesis, we'll call that theory. But it's human nature. It's how these constructs are going to, re to interact with each other. So the action in this climactic scene, your results section, we're saying this is the, this is the battle scene with the Death Star also known as hypothesis one was supported. We actually found a significant and positive relationship between the uh, people belonging to specialization and the sense of community. We found that there was a, uh, a t-test was significant at alpha less than 0.05 for belonging to being in one of the specializations versus being in an individual program plan and your um, reported number of hours spent uh, in social interactions with other members of the MIM program, or however the heck you conceptualized it and measured it. Right? So it's not quite as much fun as watching the battle scene with the Death Star. But that's essentially what you're doing, is you're saying this is what happened when we did all this stuff and put them in. So you describe the behavior of the characters, the variables, in the scene, in the study. If it's group behavior, you're going to be providing summary information. We're going to have means. We're going to have um, mean, median, mode, that kind of stuff. You're going to have tests to confirm or disconfirm the hypotheses. Those are your arrows. The discussion is going to interpret those results, the character's behavior, in light of the predictions, the hypotheses, to confirm, disconfirm, or extend the theory from the background section. So the results section says, Han Luke turned off his targeting computer and used the force. Han Solo came back and helped. The discussion section is where you say, oh, so this shows that Han Solo is not just an uncaring mercenary 
and that Luke is choosing the side of spirituality and intuition. All right, that's where you actually tie that in for the reader. Yeah. Could you miss pardon? Mm -hmm. Could you miss pardon this part, like how this tied to the city? To which? Okay, so what we're saying is, so, so what would this look like? Um, so in the results section, we would say there was a positive and significant relationship between uh, choosing a specialization and um, increasing the amount of time that you spent socially with people in the MIM program. And your self-report of a feeling of community among the MIM students. Okay? In the discussion section is where you say, and that significant relationship shows that personal identification with a group is, as a theory, personal identification is more important than um, just the provision of tailored information. The fact that people were self-identified as being in a particular specialization, they saw that as a group behavior. They were more likely to help members of their own group than members of other group. So in-group theory indicates that. And so now we found out that in-group theory and personal identification is a very powerful motivator, very powerful theory for understanding the dynamics of students in a program. Right? Does that help? Mm -hmm. So we're saying not just what were the results of the statistical test, but what did it say about our theory? Yes, our theory was confirmed. No, our theory wasn't confirmed. And they may say, you know, it was confirmed for people who are in project management and in strategic management or information, but people who are in the individual program plan, they, they didn't report any sense of community. So maybe there's something about particular specializations that make people more community oriented than others. Or maybe it's that the people who were community oriented to begin with tended to go into things like project management. It's those people who are, are independent loners went into the individual program plan because they don't want no one telling them what to do. What do you mean we're going bowling on Friday night? I'm going to go do what I want to do. So this is the difference between what was the results of the hypotheses and what does it now say about the nature of community and the things that predict whether communities will or will not develop. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. Um, so the discussion, you're interpreting the results, what actually happened, in light of the predictions and the hypotheses to confirm, disconfirm, or extend your theory from the background section, you're drawing inferences about the characters and the laws that govern them. Right, the laws that govern them are the arrows. That's the theory. That's the why. And you can suggest further research. Remember Darth Vader is in the little fighter and he gets spun off into outer space? That's future research. Also known as the possibility of a sequel. <laughs> the conclusion should relate to the introduction. It should... It Remind us why we care about these results. This is where we see Han Solo and Luke Skywalker getting medals and Chewbacca, getting medals. Being given the medals by... Who's no longer in danger? <laughs> Who's no longer in danger? We, we actually resolve that dramatic tension. So this is where we say, oh, you know, it has long been thought that, but actually this, and this new information is important to us because, that's why I say it should relate to the introduction where you said we need to know this new information, it will be important because, I kid you not, when I write this section, I copy the introduction, I put it at the bottom of my paper, and then I reword it <laughs> to make those same points. They are related to each other. They're integrally related to each other. Or if you had the scale and scope problem with the introduction, your conclusion is, and now we have the knowledge, the tools, the ability to help us deal with that scale and scope, and we're, therefore we're not all going to die. That's the conclusion section. 
it relates directly to the, introdu the introduction, it resolves that dramatic tension, and explains why we should care about this. References. Make sure that the author's uh, info, uh, author's issues and, and uh, points are accurately represented. I have read things that have said that have cited my work and said that I showed this. I didn't show that. It's not what I showed. I've had things rejected with reviewers saying that this author is clearly unaware of the paper Winter 1992 where this was already done. I didn't do that in that paper. So when your stuff is getting reviewed, associate editors are looking for people who can review your work. One of the places they will go to find reviewers who can review your work is your reference list. So, make sure that you're accurately representing what the person said, and you should have the reference in the introduction if it's a reference that says this is an important issue. The reference should be in the background section if it's about what's already known about these characters. It should be in the methods section if it's about using these methods. So you don't just take these references and sprinkle them through there kind of wherever. <laughs> right? They actually should have a purpose there. Um, and if you get something rejected, don't just decide that you're not going to revise it, you're going to send it to a new outlet, because I have been the reviewer who rejected it and got it back again from a different journal and have had to call up the associate editor and say, I rejected this from another journal a month ago. It is unchanged. What would you like me to do? To which the answer has generally been, review it. which causes me to say, I'm familiar with this work from the last time I reviewed it, where I found significant problems that are essentially unaddressed. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to be in that. There's a limited number of reviewers. It's a small community. The same people may very well get it over again. Make sure you've actually addressed these concerns before you send it out to a different outlet. Um, the abstract, the overview of the article, explaining the purpose of the article, the participants, what was done, summary of the important findings, usually around 150 words, you write this last. You write this last and you do it by going through the article and finding good sentences and then putting them together at the front. So some of the co-authors I've worked with, we'll, we'll name Brian by name. <laughs> when we start writing an article, the, the abstract generally says, blah, 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 some words here. <laughs> and then you move on. We actually really write together um, comments. Section is very helpful in Word or in Google Docs because you actually can put, this section should do this. This section should do that. And then as you're writing it, you're reminding yourself of what this section ought to be doing. Right? When I'm reviewing things, I often will look at the literature review, and everything that's a construct they're talking about, I make a box. And everything that they say this should lead to that, I put in an error. So at the end of my reviewing of my reading the literature review, I should be able to generate a box as an arrow model. I will then compare it to the boxes and arrow model the author has provided to see where there's some slippage. Are there things they talked about that's not actually in the model? Are there things in the model they didn't talk about? And then go look at the analyses. Are there analyses for every one of those arrows? Are there analyses in there that, have, that for which there are no arrows? Why are they doing this stuff? So your reviewers are, are this is what I do when I'm really lost in a paper. I'll tell you guys honestly, when I cannot figure out what the heck they're trying to do.